So in this video, we're gonna talk about all the different models that are available and how do you actually go about picking the best one for AI software development. OpenAI have released 4.1 in the last couple of weeks. So how do you know which is the best one to use when you want to build fast and avoid as many errors as possible? Then I'm gonna do a design vibe test on some of the models that I use on a regular basis to see which one comes out best in terms of website design and front end app design. We're gonna take a look at the recent updates in Cursor 0.49 and some really interesting changes from Windsurf. And we're gonna cover the recent system prompt leaks from Cursor, Windsurf and Replit and learn how this can help us build better software and better agents. So if you want to build apps really quickly with AI, I highly recommend checking out switchdimension.com. I've got a course and a community there that teaches you how to build a web app and how to work with AI to 10x your web app ready. So there's many different ways that you can benchmark a model, but as AI builders, as software developers, we're probably most interested in the benchmarks related to software development. So the first place you want to go is to LM or Language Model Arena. So this gives us lots of different popular benchmarks allow, along with crowdsource AI benchmarking, where thousands of people vote on which model is better in an A-B testing manner, which gives us a more authentic view on what is a good model. So this is a generalized view. Let's look at the web development arena. We can see that Claude 3.7 is currently leading, followed by GPT 4.1 then Gemini Pro, and then of course you have a ton of votes for Claude 3.5, but this has been superseded by Claude 3.7, and then you've got V3, R1, etc. These are pretty much my favorite models as well. So for the majority of code implementation, or when you're writing code, 3.7 or 4.1 are the most popular models. I'll use Gemini 2.5 or OpenAI 03 to do some thinking and reasoning upfront so if I'm planning out a new feature, I'll have a conversation with either Gemini or O3 on how that new feature should be built out, do some planning around it. And then when I'm actually writing the code and implementing, I'll switch over to Claude 3.7 or 4.1. Next up, I go to openrouter.ai and check out the rankings and I'd filter for programming. So this gives us a live view of how people are actually voting with their wallets and where they're spending their money in terms of requests from these different APIs. So you can see here that the usage has changed over the last couple of weeks. And if we look at the top this week, Anthropic 3.7 is leading, followed by Gemini, and then we have 4.1. And as you can see, you make your way down the model. And it's also worth taking a look at vellum.ai. I find this tool useful because you can do a side-by-side -side comparison against different models. And it also gives you a breakdown of some of the key features of each. So the things you wanna keep in mind when working with a model is, number one is the context size. So how big of a window does it have for fitting your code base, your system prompts, and all the information that you want to send with it? In the example of Google, we have a 1 million token context window and Claude 3.7 is 200,000. Now that is perfectly fine for dealing with most small code bases, but if you want more context and you've got a very large code base, maybe you want a bigger context window. So the cutoff date is also important. You can see here it's November 2024. If you're working with a recent framework that has had changes or update in its documentation, it's not going to have it if it's after this date. So in my course and community, switchdimension.com, we talk about how we can use web search, you can attach documentation, or you can use MCPs to pull in the most recent information to make sure that you're avoiding errors in terms of implementations. Um, you have your in and out cost in terms of tokens. So obviously you're going to be sending content, but also receiving it back. You've got your latency, which is you know how fast that model is. So you can see here when working with Gemini 2.5, it's a reasoning and a thinking model. I use this more when I'm doing planning of features rather than actually code implementation. And then I'll use Claude 3.7 or OpenAI 4.1 in terms of implementation of the code. So some of the key benchmarks you wanna pay attention to in relation to software development and AI models is the SWE bench. So that's the software engineering bench. 
So the SWE bench will test, see how well a model does in solving GitHub issues. And you can see here that Claude 3.7 does really well along with OpenAI 03 and onwards from there. So benchmarks are just one thing to pay attention to. You need to be aware that all these companies are aware of these kind of benchmarks and they may overfit their models to perform very well on these particular tests so you just need to work with the models yourself and vibe test them to see which one you work best with the other thing to be aware of is many of these models that are coming out at the moment they might pre perform really well on a benchmark but you need to think about how well they work with your chosen tool whether that's cursor Klein, windsurf or other how well are they integrated into those coding environments, how well do they follow instructions, how well do they work with the tools. And a lot of this you can only really figure out from working with a particular model. So one way I will test out models against each other is I will run various different tests based on things that I do a lot, like maybe designing a website or a front end or writing some front end code for a web app that I'm building. So I'm going to do a really simple example of how I run this. So here we have a prompt. You're a professional UX designer with an emphasis on designing web pages that convert. I want to create a landing page for AI automation company Magic Reaction. Use existing next use the existing Next.js application and its components to create this full featured landing page. Choose whatever color you want, just not blue or indigo. If you want to figure out what the best color scheme is for your application, you should check out another video I have on the three design experts where you've got the product manager, the design UX expert, and the software designer, how you can talk to them to produce documentation, which is a really great start for any web app that you're building to avoid as many errors as possible. So that's also in my course, but it's free on the channel as well. Okay, so we're gonna take these prompts and we're gonna run them through for a couple of different models. So I've set up a Next.js application. It's typically best to use some kind of a component library like ShadCN and Lucid Icons because they're just these little components that just take your design up a whole extra level. So I wanted to be fair, so I offered each one of the models the same foundation to start from. So here we have OpenAI's O3, which is a reasoning model. And it's actually a pretty sweet design. We've got good use of Shad CN components here and the Lucid icons. So it really did follow the instructions carefully. It's got some customer proof and a call to action. So this is pretty good with a nice use of gradients in the background. So switching over to OpenAI 4.1, we have this, which I think isn't great. I'm not loving the icons that I decided to pull in here and all in all, it's okay. If I was going to do a first pass at design, I think what you get from O3 is a whole lot better than what we're getting from OpenAI 4.1 in this one shot example. Now, taking a look at Google's Gemini 2.5, we had a pretty decent implementation. It followed the instructions. It has a good use of the icons and the components and has a good breakdown in terms of a landing page. DeepSeek V3 had a pretty decent output as well with some nice gradients in place. And again, using Shad CN and icons effectively, leaving space for some images to be added. And you'll note that most of these are going with like three or four featured sections. So we have a hero, a benefit section, a call to action and a footer. And last on the list is Claude 3.7, which I think is my favorite output. We have a nice hero section with space for an image to be added. We have a feature list. We have a benefits list. We have more client testimonials for social proof, our pricing structure, frequently asked questions, a call to action, and then a full featured footer. By far, this is the best output in terms of front end design. This isn't a surprise to me. You'll notice that all my previous videos, I heavily use 3.7 and 3.5 when I'm doing any kind of front end development. In terms of our vibe test, it has the best output. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the recent updates in Cursor 0.49. Apparently there's some improvements around automated rules. You can actually generate Cursor rules from scratch from a conversation. If you just type slash generate cursor rules at the end of any conversation, it will attempt to generate a rule based on the conversation that you've just had. So if you structure 
components in a particular way or you like to work with a particular or you like to write in a particular style you can theoretically generate a rule around that without having to write it from scratch here's an example of one i created that basically just used generate cursor rules on the root of a Next.js project and it gave me a project overview a Next.js structure and coding conventions all created in the cursor rules setup if you're familiar with cursor rules, you can then decide if they want to be always added, manually added, or requested by an agent. In this case, they need to be manually added. This isn't the best use case, but it'll be interesting to play with this over the coming weeks. Another feature that I like is the review changes button. So over here, if I click on this review changes button, I can get a drop down of all the changes that happened. You could always do that before by looking at the different file changes, but this seems to be pretty convenient and I can drop down each one to see what the diff changes are. This is a welcome feature as well. What cursor does is it generates commands that you can carry out in the agent window, but previously you weren't able to edit those changes if they were incorrect. So let's say it said, let's install shadcn UI components. That's the old way of installing them. You want to prompt it to use the new way. You would have to stop the whole exchange and correct it. But now what you can do is simply edit that command in the agent chat itself, which is a nice improvement. Jumping over to Windsurf, something that came out in the last couple of weeks that I haven't covered is their new deployment ability. So I think this is pretty cool and I'd like to see other IDEs follow suit with this as well. It's the ability to deploy your project directly to Netlify in this case. So if you've used Bolt or Lovable or any other tool like that, you'll be familiar with their ability to deploy and launch your application really quickly. And so what Windsurf is offering here is this ability to write your code within this code editor and then actually deploy it directly using Netlify without having to do a lot of the build setup or the DevOps, etc. And I think that's pretty powerful. So another interesting development from Windsurf, they're pricing themselves just that little bit cheaper than Cursor now. They're moving away from their flow action credits, which were, to be honest, a little bit too confusing to a more standardized way using user prompt credits. It's also really interesting to note that Windsurf is in talks with OpenAI to be acquired for something like 3 billion. We've seen that a lot of frontier model providers realize that a huge application of their large language models is in code and software development. Frankly, I think it's where it shines the most and they realize this, of course, as well. We've seen in the last updates from Anthropic that they're heavily focusing on the developer ecosystem and OpenAI are seeing the same and they've really started to change their terminology and their press releases to focus on software developers with their latest iterations like 4.1. So it'll be really interesting to see how these negotiations develop over the coming weeks. So in the last couple of days, we've also seen a lot of apparent system prompt leaks from providers like Cursor, Windsurf, etc. Here is one particular example where Pliny or Pliny the Liberator has said they have jailbroken and are releasing the system prompt for Cursor. How Cursor will interact with any large language model in order to get the best outputs. And you can see it broken down here in terms of the context setup, communication guidelines, tool usage, etc. There's actually a couple of different GitHub repositories that detail and cover all of these different prompts from Pliny and also check out Juju Milk as well for leak system prompts. There's some comparable ones there. So I went and I dumped these repositories into Cursor and I ran a prompt to break them down into separate MD files and to perform a comparative analysis. And it generated this explainer on the common themes across each of the prompts. They all use strong identities, like I'm an expert software engineer, put strong purposing behind them. There's a big emphasis on tool execution and workflows, constraints around those tools, how to handle not just code generation, but manipulation, how to communicate with the user, and of course, context awareness, security ethics, etc. So if you want to improve your own prompting, it's worth taking a look at some of these repositories. And also if you're building out similar tools yourself, you can get a good breakdown and understand how it's been done before. Is this a critical leak for these providers? I don't necessarily think so. The system prompt is certainly an important component of how these tools work. In reality, it's a lot more complex than that. It's about individual system prompts, tool usage, memory, 
context awareness, context packaging and summarization, all these things come together to produce a really good AI code IDE. It's not just the system prompt. So I don't think this is essentially a huge deal for any of these